Hi, just doing an audio check. Hello everyone and thank you so much for joining today. We are having some technical difficulties that we are working to resolve and we should be getting started in a few minutes. Hello everyone, my name is Karen Fleshman and I am the president of the Black Alumni Board. We do apologize, we were having some technical issues and um, apparently we've got them resolved. So I wanna thank you all for joining us today. You know, we're very ex excited to have you here. Again, I am Karen Fleshman, president of the Black Alumni Board and also founder of Haskins Advisory Group. I always like to start these events with a thank you. And so I like what, what I like to do is to thank everyone that's been involved in you know, bringing this event to flourishing. In a minute, it's gonna sound like I am uh, winning an award or something, but it, and I must say, to some extent, it feels that way because um, again, it is one of our, it is our first event. I want to start by thanking the previous board for establishing a foundation that we could build on. I want to thank Vita and Renee and Andrew and the rest of the, um, the previous board for the work that they did. Next, I'd like to thank Alumni Relations. I mean, we could not have done this without uh, specifically Paula and also Tim and their commitment and their sponsorship or I, I should say their support of this event. Next, I wanna thank our illustrious speaker today, Dr. Tanja Coleman. Dr. Coleman is a highly sought after organizational development expert and we are totally, uh, we are completely honored to have her. Next, I wanna thank our, the board sponsor, Paul Davidovich. Paul has been a just an, an amazing anchor for the board, you know, over the last year. Paul, without your guidance and encouragement, you know, I don't know if this event would have come to fruition. And we want to thank you so much for your advocacy and how you have advocated on behalf of the board. We really appreciate that. Before the, world, <clears throat> before the world exploded due to the tragic murder of George Floyd and the continued brutality and systematic racism, race, racism inflicted on black people in this country, a small dedicated group of Loyola alums were and are working dil diligently to help the university to reconnect with its black alumni and to also provide better support to its black 
who is Black students. And we're doing this by designing engaging programs like what you're going to see today that provides access to the university's resources through mentorship and networking opportunities. Now I want to introduce you to this dedicated group of alumni. Next slide. First, I'd like to introduce you to Saritha, and Saritha is our recording secretary. Saritha's professionalism has given credibility to the board as she keeps us on track and she maintains like all of our records. And she's been involved with this board since the very inception back in December of 2018. Next, I'd like to introduce you to Jay. And Jay is our treasurer. Jay can be counted on to always ask the hard questions. Jay is the actual, he actually created the name of the event and you're gonna hear more about that shortly. Next is Dawn. Dawn is our VP of communication. And Dawn's only been with us for a couple of months, but her impact has been mighty. She has established our social media platform. So we, now we have a social media presence. You know, we have a growing uh, Facebook and network, Facebook and LinkedIn community, I should say you know, because of Don's efforts. Next, I'd like to introduce you to Shakira Richards. Shakira is the VP of student members. Shakira is a, is a former president of the Black Cultural Center, which is a student-run organization on Loyola campus. Shakira is all about addressing social problems so that she digs in and she gets her, you know, she gets her hands dirty and her feet wet, her feet wet. She, um, she is, it makes uh, sense why she graduated from Loyola because she is just committed to uh, social change. She actually has three degrees. So next slide. Shakira actually has three degrees from Loyola, and she's also a, um, a Ball State University graduate as well. Um, she has three masters in mental health, social work, and also a behavior analysis. And Shakira is all about, again, people and solving problems within our society. Shakira has also, she also has the honor of working at one of the most prestigious civil rights organizations in the world, in this country, and some may even say the world, and an organization that is truly affecting change, and that is the Chicago Urban League. At the Chicago Urban League, Shakira is responsible for student management, for managing the student development program. And she is just an amazing individual. She has been an active board member for over 10 years. And Shakira can be counted on to bring us great ideas and to help keep us motivated as a team and moving forward. So what I'd like to do now is to pass it over to our moderator, Shakira Richards. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much, Karen, for that awesome introduction. You made me sound really um, important, so I appreciate um, your your light into my my experience. So, good afternoon, everyone. I am Shakira Richards. I am uh, the senior program manager at the Chicago Urban League in our youth services center. I graduated from Loyola University back in 2010. Uh, with my first two bachelors and I went back to Loyola for the Graduate School of Social Work and I got my MSW in 2012 from Loyola. So I am a true rambler. I, I love Loyola and I am so excited to have you all a part of our first virtual event for the Black Alumni Board. As Karen said, I've been active with the Black Alumni Board since graduating in 2010, and this has been a rewarding and very, very monumental journey in my professional development and my career. 
And so I really love this board. I'm really excited for the direction that we're going in and the relationship that we have with Loyola Alumni Relations. So thank you again to Paula and Tim for your continued support and dedication to the Black Alumni Board and making sure that our vision and our efforts and our needs to really restore and bring community amongst our, our alumni is there and present. So we appreciate you. We welcome you all to our first virtual event, the Black, Black Light Speaker Series. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of background as to where the Black Light Speaker Series um, came from. And then I'm also going to um, introduce to you our panel or our, um, our speaker for today, as well as Dawn, who will be doing our Q&A. So throughout, this, throughout our time here and throughout the session, make sure you're writing down your questions and getting them in. There's a Q&A box that you all can utilize, and Dawn will be going through the Q&A box to make sure that we get everyone's questions addressed in a timely fashion. And so please, don't worry, your questions will be addressed. We will be addressing them at the end of our session with Dr. Coleman. And next, I will be introducing to you Dr. Coleman. Um, but before I get to that, I wanna give you a little bit of background on the name Black Light Speaker Series. The Black Light Speaker Series name is derived from the function of a black light which is designed to illuminate things that are hidden and not seen without the presence of the black light. It is our goal to illuminate the light and the life of black alumni post Loyola and how they've carried out the mission and principles of Loyola into their communities, work, profession, and causes. The Black Light Speaker Series is the first for the university and is created to invite people in to learn and see more of the Black alumni professional community and civic contributions. The series will provide the opportunity for networking and to highlight Loyola graduates who will have conversations on issues that are experienced in the Black community and topics that are relevant to Black people and what we are experiencing as a community and culture and how we transition forward. The first series will illuminate the issue of systemic racism in the workplace. Most importantly, while evaluating these issues, we want to provide solutions that reform these systems to remove the weights and free Black Americans and to reach their full given potential and have an equitable share of the American pie. Black alums will have a forum to highlight their transformative work and share their expertise and collaborate in our efforts to support each other and build community back at Loyola. The series will also provide an opportunity for Black students to hear firsthand how Black Loyola alumni are executing the mission and the values of Loyola University Chicago, social justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and also to network and build a pipeline for mentorship and engagement to the Loyola community after graduation. So with that being said, I am so excited to introduce our first speaker for the Black Light Speaker Series, Dr. Tanja Coleman. And next we will watch a video to give a little bit more insight as to what Dr. Coleman has been doing post Loyola. <laughs>
Without further ado, I would love and I am honored to present Dr. Tanja Coleman, and she will be our next speaker. After Dr. Coleman's presentation, we will have Q&A. Thank you and welcome Dr. Coleman. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so honored to be here and also be chosen as the first speaker for the Loyola Black Alumni Series and Association. Um, a little bit of pressure with being the first and uh, added pressure of having some technical difficulties. But one of the things about being a DEI facilitator is you have to be quick on your feet and you have to solve problems fairly seamlessly and just keep things moving. So I will go through some information that I had prepared for this call today um, with everyone that's tuning in. So many of you saw what was in the video, just really around some of the things that I've been up to since uh, attending Loyola University and graduating, and somehow they are just not allowed to get rid of me. So I continue, uh, even after graduation, to be very immersed in the university and their efforts and what they're trying to do from a community standpoint, but also awareness, education, and specifically around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so um, since then, last year, I was Benedictine University's Visionary Award recipient. And um, that award was really unique because it, it allowed me, I was the only African-American woman to win that award in that category. And I probably was the youngest uh, in, that, in that pool of candidates that won the award as well. Um, most of the award recipients graduated in like 1969 and 70, and I had graduated in 2016, so fairly new. Since then, I've also do quite a bit of research, mainly around women in leadership and diversity, equity, and inclusion as a whole. And from that, I was a two-time Best Paper Award winner um, through the Academy of Management. And one of my papers has been translated into three languages, so in English, Spanish, and French. I'm also the author of the Who Are We Diversity Journal, really meant to broaden people's perspective. And that was authored in 2018, so long before a lot of the recent social and racial unrest, because I saw even then that we needed to begin bridging the gap, bridging communities, and having conversation. On the philanthropic side, I'm also a mentor for Emmerman's Angels, um, which is an international cancer support organization, and also am the newly elected, as of this year, started my duties as the program development chair for the Academy of Management Consulting Division. Next slide. Through my Dr. Tanja DEI Consulting and OD Institute, you can see I have several offerings that really help organizations from realizing what some of the issues are, what some of the, the initiatives are that they need to start in their organization by facilitating listening tours and team discovery sessions to really figuring out what communication needs to happen, how to support senior team members, as well as helping organizations build their employee resource groups and also helping them build diversity committees as well and also giving them several options around leadership development. So that's what I do with the DEI Consulting and OD Institute of my organization. So I like to always start with communication because I think that is the beginning of any real change. People have to have conversation. They have to be able to have an understanding of what's happening and why. And so I'm a huge proponent of creating a model by which people engage in conversation and communication. So what needs to happen right now? A lot of people are talking, but not enough people are listening. And what does listening really mean? Um, it means being open-minded, embodying active listening skills, not coming to a conclusion before the person even finishes their sentence, really being open to hearing other people's experiences and how it impacts them, not defend your position on it and not try to reason why it happened, but really take in its totality 
what the person is communicating to you. Then you wanna learn from that communication. You wanna ask questions. You wanna be able to process the information so that the person that is communicating to you feels heard. Oftentimes we hear lots of people say they talk, but they don't feel heard, they don't feel understood. And that's partly because people haven't appropriately listened. And then at the learning phase has just been pretty much obsolete. They're not asking questions and they're not inquisitive about why something or a particular issue or incident bothers you or what impact has had. Then you wanna take what you've heard, what you've learned, and you wanna leverage that information. And that really means how do you then become an ally? How do you take that information and educate others? How do you become more hypersensitive to your own biases? And when you see microaggressions, when you see other things happening, how are you leveraging that information that you heard and that you learned from? Next slide, please. So one of the things, once again, now that you have the model for active listening, what I engage my clients in is what we call team discovery sessions or culture and listening sessions. And it's really where you have a trained facilitator who provides a safe space for discussion, where there's no judgment, where there's open dialogue, and where there's leadership participation and sponsorship. And then you talk about those discussion points. And one of the things with these sessions that I think is really important for leaders and organizations to understand is that you really do need what I call a trained facilitator. Because sometimes with these conversations, they're very emotional. Any discussion around racial injustice, um, anti-racist behavior, diversity, equity, and inclusion can really bring about a lot of raw emotion in people. You want to be able to manage that. You want to be able to allow everyone to have a voice that's in those meetings. And it's easy to get off track very quickly if you have someone that's not really a trained facilitator. So I also like to suggest that it's a neutral party. You don't have to have someone inside of the organization that's a leader managing these calls because then people tend to not be as open and transparent as you would like and they tend to feel like whatever they share will be held against them and they will be judged by it later so you want to make sure it's a neutral party for a couple reasons one it shows your team and organization that you're serious about the conversation that you're willing to invest in the conversation because it's important important. But also, you want to have a facilitator there so everyone, even your HR team members, even your internal diversity specialists can be part of the conversation as well without feeling like they have to manage it, facilitate it, take notes, all of those things, that they can be an active participant as an employee of that organization as well. Next slide, please. So what can we do? So a lot, you're, I'm hearing this constantly from clients, from uh, team members. What can we do? We did, it, we did not know things were the way that they are. These are some simple things that you can do that will have either zero cost or minimal cost to the organization. Also, what I see a lot of organizations doing as a very reactive mechanism is immediately beefing up their talent acquisition really focused on bringing people in, bringing people in. And I always say it's great to recruit diverse candidates that are um, qualified for the organization that are great fits, but also take the time to stop and reflect and think about how the current diverse team members are being treated, right? Do they have access to leadership development programs? If you have leadership development programs, are they being managed in a way that's equitable across the board? Meaning that you don't have a leadership development program and not have any people of color in the program when you have people of color that are employees, right? That people have exposure to executive coaches to really help them curtail any type of career derailing behaviors. Do they have access to mentorship programs? 
these programs often inside of an organization can result in individuals not only having a mentor, but also having a sponsor and an ally. So make sure that the programs that you have in terms of getting people from one step to the next, moving their career forward in an in a equitable and um, fair way are put in place. These are things that should be happening for your current team members as a way to help them bring in other individuals and recruit other individuals and refer other individuals. If people feel disenfranchised themselves, feel like they're not given access to leadership development, they're not given access to career mobility, they're not going to recommend their friends, their colleagues, their sorority sisters and fraternity brothers to your organization. Also another piece that I think is really important that we often lose sight of are stay interviews. So we all have worked in organizations where when you leave the organization, you exit the organization, you have, typically you have some type of survey or meeting with your leader or with HR to determine why you're leaving the organization. Everyone wants to know at that point what run or why, what information and feedback do you have. Um, typically there is a big party thrown for you, but the people that have been there are rarely uh, have this opportunity to have access to HR, to have access to their leader, to have a party. So really start to divide that time to the people that are currently in your organization. Why are they there? Why did they join the organization? What has incentivized them to stay? Are they planning on leaving in the next six months or so? If they are, why? What obstacles can you remove to make the workplace more equitable, to make it more inclusive or whatever the person is telling you would help them stay with the organization or whatever it is they feel that they're struggling with. Also, we wanna consider compensation parity, right? You can pull a compensation survey and splice it and break it down to see how your team members are being compensated. Is there an equity gap? And if there is, can you explain why? So if there's an equity gap, you might have someone on your team like our wonderful Shakira who has three degrees <laughs> and you can explain that. You can say she has a, a, an ex exorbitant amount of education and has put in the time to earn this amount over someone else. So as long as you can explain it and it's reasonable and it makes sense, great. What most people cannot do is they cannot explain the difference because sometimes there is no reason for the difference. And so that's when you have to go back and make changes. Also think about performance and position equity as well. Research shows oftentimes African-American women are the last people to receive their performance review and have the discussion. Why is that? It's because the sense is, or the feeling is, you're not valued. At least that's what it looks like without a conversation. With the conversation, it could just be a scheduling situation. Without a conversation, it can certainly appear to be um, discriminatory in some way. You also wanna look at position e equity. If you have hierarchical positions, assistant manager, associate manager, manager, senior manager, director. You want to think about what those roles look like and who's in those roles and why are they there. If you see a gap or you see consistently that as you move up in the organization, your individuals of color, particularly black employees are falling off, then you want to look at why. Also, you want to have an aligned internal recruitment process. I know some of us really talk about external and that should be considered too. But what we're talking about right now is what can organizations do right now inside of their companies that is going to not cost them really any additional money, right? So I've heard stories of individuals re going through an internal recruitment process that it consists of two to three to four times the number of people and or steps as their peers. And so why is that? Why is that happening? You wanna make sure that any internal processes that are in place 
are there and being exercised across the board. If individuals have to speak with 10 leaders, every person should have to speak to 10 leaders, not just your black employees, not just people of color, but everyone. So you want to make sure that all processes are equitable. And this is one as working with clients and also um, receiving feedback from individuals. This is something that could use some attention in most organizations. Next slide, please. So how can each of us contribute to inclusive environments? Voice, you, want to, you need to be the voice for diversity, equity, and inclusion. I know we talk about recruiting allies, that's external. We have to look inside to what we can do. So if you feel like there's enough individuals in your organization to start an ERG group, to start a diversity committee, speak up and say so. Be the voice for diversity, equity, and inclusion in your organization. Also be a resource and an active participant whenever possible. So if there is a diversity committee, if there is an ERG group, be a part of it. Help make a difference. And continue to develop and excel. So this is within you. We've all been part of organizations that haven't been a good cultural fit for us. We've all had leaders that didn't have our back, that didn't believe in us, or we're actively doing things against our success. You have to be the owner of your own development and don't let anyone stifle your goals and where you want to go. Also practice and know the anatomy of a developmental conversation. So don't address issues when you are personally upset about it. You also want to pause and listen but you want to be very clear in whatever point you're making and whatever point you're trying to convey. So you also want to understand the difference and secure a sponsor, a mentor, and have a role model. And most people conflate the three together, but they're very different and what each person's contribution is, is very different. A sponsor is someone who has power, who at the table people listen to, because that person is empowered to make change and empowered to influence others. A mentor really guides you, coaches, gives advice. So if there's something that's bothering you, if there's a, a process or a conversation you wanna have, you wanna run it by someone, determine how you should have that, what information to include, when you should include it, that's what a mentor is there for. A role model typically might be someone you don't necessarily have one-on-one -on -one contact with or access with, but you see their behaviors and their image, and it's one that is encouraging to you, inspiring to you, and so you look to that person as a means of inspiration. So some role models might be Michelle Obama, right? A role model might be Oprah Winfrey. A role model could be Bill Gates. That's someone that you, you um, feel good about, that you're inspired by, that is doing great things in the world and in business. Also, I, I want to just talk quickly because I know we're getting to the Q&A portion and I don't want to uh, tap into that time. But diversity, equity, and inclusion should be a movement and not a moment. And I know we hear lots of people saying that, but some anecdotal feedback that I'm getting even in the last week or two weeks is that the diversity conversation is either slowing down, dissipating completely, or people are saying it's not as important anymore. So we have to keep the fire burning on this. We have to keep carrying the torch. And now is the time to make sure that you research diversity, equity, and inclusion resources and consultants that might come into your organization. And I'll give you an example. So after the George Floyd situation, a lot of people jumped into diversity that weren't trained in it, that weren't ever anti-racist champions, and went to organizations and maybe gave some information that wasn't very helpful. 
So people have checked the box and they're done and they feel like they had this training. One thing that I make sure I do as not only a consultant, but just as a black woman, is to make sure that I'm connecting the dots. It doesn't mean anything to come in and do a training and give people lots of definitions without them understanding the impact of what you're saying. What is the actual impact in an organization of unconscious bias, of implicit bias, of non-allyship? What does that look like? How does it impact you? How does it impact your career trajectory? So that's one of the things you want to make sure of as well. And you want to ensure that the conversation continues. It's also really important for individuals and organizations and leaders to understand that they need to address systemic gaps that derive from systems that have been put in place that are racist. Regardless of was it intentional or non-intentional, the outcome is the same. We're seeing people of color not reaching the plateaus from a career perspective as they should be. So another quick, convert, quick point that I'll make is entrepreneurship. So I, I hear a lot of folks saying, well, you know, if you're not gonna get it here, just become an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurship is not necessarily meant for everyone. And quite frankly, we people of color and black people in particular, we pay organizations fees for different things, and we deserve to have a space. So if you want to be an entrepreneur, great. You shouldn't be forced into it because there's not a pathway. And so I think it's incumbent upon all of us to ensure that there's a pathway to both entities, whether you want to be internal, in-house, employee, where you have a great career trajectory, where you're getting leadership development, where you're treated equitably and fairly, and also as an entrepreneur, where you have access to loans and venture capital, and you're part of supplier diversity initiatives and procurement initiatives as well, so that your business can grow and thrive. So those are a few things that I wanted to share with you this afternoon. And I know I'm seeing, I'm seeing some questions in chat as well. So I will stop here so that I can respond to your questions. Dr. Coleman, thank you so much for that fantastic information. Um, really enjoyed that. And I know that the audience did too. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us today. I want to welcome you to the Q&A portion of today's session. My name is Donna Demokunwa and I am the Vice President of Communications for the Loyola Black Alumni Board. So let's go ahead and get into the questions. Just a quick reminder that you can enter your questions in the Q&A box. It, it will come to us directly and we'll try to get as many questions answered as we can. All right, Dr. Coleman, so the first question we have here says that there's a lot of conversation going on, of course, right now about diversity, inclusion, and equity. Where do you see this going within the next three to five years? Hopefully the, the conversation continues, but not the same conversation, right? So one of the things that I work on with my clients is really building out a strategy so that it's not like I'm coming in just doing an anti-racist training. That to me doesn't solve the problem and I'm less apt to have a lot of those type of trainings take up my time because I feel as if, if you're not willing to commit to the educational part as well as the strategic part, as well as the action piece of it, right? It's three different verticals. If you're not willing to commit to all those verticals, you're probably not very serious about DNI. You just want to say you went through training, people should be equitable and fair. You don't understand why they're not. They sat through six hours of training. They should know better. But at the end of the day, everything looks the same. So you really want to work with organizations as a DEI professional that are committed to DEI initiatives, not just for the short term, but for the longer term. And so I think as DEI professionals too, we have to, we understand this, uh, you're an entrepreneur, 
and you do have to put food on your table, but really helping people. Sometimes people just need guidance. They don't know what they don't know. So you just have to show them the way that it should be. And oftentimes they'll walk on the journey with you. And next thing you know, you have a two or three year strategy with, or an engagement with a client versus just coming in doing a three to six hour training that's not giving the the individuals in that training, any real information on the impact. You're just going over definitions, not the impact. And so what people start to feel is they start to uh, feel as if this is not important or people are just whining. Why can't they get over it? So they really need to understand the systemic impact, both from a cultural and community perspective, but also from a professional perspective. I really love that response, Dr. Coleman, and you stated it so well. It's not going to take one quick training to rectify this. It should be an ongoing uh, conversation and ongoing relationship with whoever is facilitating the discussion. Um, all right, so we have another question here in the chat. Uh, do you have any advice for joining or participating in conversations and equity groups without having all of the labor for change falling on the black and brown people? Oh my goodness, you struck a note and I had actually written it in my notes, but I didn't address it because I was talking so much. So yes, I am absolutely seeing this and people are coming to me on LinkedIn and other asking for advice. So what I'm, what I'm really concerned about is this kind of duality of role, meaning you're a black person in an organization. You might be a business development director, right? Not really immersed in diversity initiatives at all. And all of a sudden you're told to head up diversity without a budget and without resources. So now instead of one job, you have two. <laughs> and how do you, how do you manage that? So some of the feedback that I've been giving individuals is, talk to the leader and really figure out why there isn't a budget. I always find that leaders and organizations invest in what they feel is important. And there's generally money somewhere. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and also really determine what the goals are. So you're being asked to head up diversity. What does that mean? What would that leader want to see as a byproduct of your involvement? list two to three strategic goals. Most of the time and the feedback that I've received is people can't. They can't because they haven't thought it through. They just dumped it on someone to say that they're doing something, but they don't even know what the something is they want to solve for. So I would say st stay steadfast in getting what the outcome should be and what your level of commitment can be given your formal position and be very clear and be very direct about it. Because at the end of the day, if it blows up, you're going to be accountable for it. If it works out well, more than likely what will happen is you will get minimal recognition and someone else will take all the glory. So be clear and also be clear how this is going to help your career trajectory moving on. Great point. Great point, Dr. Coleman. Another question we have is how often should organizations meet to discuss racial issues? At what point should we see meaningful change and how long does it take? I mean, that's a loaded question, but what would be your response, Dr. Coleman? I don't think it ever stops. We always have to be aware. And in organizations, people come and go all the time. So you're not, even if you do diversity training this year, next year, you might have two or three new members of a leadership team that hasn't been through that. So you always have to catch people up to where you've been and where you are and then inform them of where you're trying to go. So I don't see it as ever really stopping, but what I do see is there should be evolution happening in organizations. There should be improvement, there should be wins, there should be accountability, and there should be a way to monitor metrics by which you can say in 2020 I was here, in 2021, we agreed to be here and we're there or we're not there. And this is why we came up short and re reactivate that action plan. I think a good measure for strategic action planning that I work with organizations on is once a quarter. Now, some organizations want once a month 
because they're like, we wanna stay on top of it. We wanna know if it's off the rails before quarter, but most organizations want to review um, any type of diversity strategic plan initiative and metrics once a quarter. Okay. And one final question, uh, Dr. Coleman, when having sessions at an organization, what specific topics do you address with the organization regarding race? Should you address specific incidents of racism or be more general about what's going on at the organization? Well, I think that's, it's really important to have an intake meeting with your clients, meaning you have a clear understanding as what's going on, what's happening. Some organizations really haven't had um, clear issues of racism or haven't had issues of discriminatory behavior, but they still want to be woke and aware and evolving in this space. So those conversations and meetings look very different than some others who people have no semblance of what's happening in the world and why. And so in either instance, though, I just like to take definitions and make them come to life. And that means through illustration, that means really showing how that, it, how that has impacted a particular group or a particular individual. Because I don't think, it's nice to have the definitions, but if people don't understand how unconscious bias impacts someone's entire career trajectory, then it's just a definition on paper or now on screen. <laughs> And they, they're not able to connect the dots to, okay, how, how did this impact so-and-so? We hired them. What's the problem? They came into the organization and they weren't able to do the work or they didn't fit in. Well, what does that mean? If you come into the organization and you're not onboarded properly, you're not part of the water cooler conversations where information is transferred, um, and shared, and so you're behind the eight ball on projects because of that, that's all unconscious bias. That all has an impact on your career. So I take those definitions and walk people through kind of a cycle of what that looks like. Wow, thank you for that response, Dr. Coleman. I have one question that I would like to sure. ask you. Uh, what are some books and or resources um, that you would like to give to us today that would help us address these issues? Well, I have a long list of podcasts, so I have kind of the a trifecta. So I know some people like reading or listening to audiobooks. Other folks really enjoy podcasts. Other folks really like movies. I have an entire resource guide with tons of books, movies, podcasts to have individuals looking to. Uh, one of the podcasts that I really enjoy is 1619. I think that's very informative. How to Be Anti-Racist is another wonderful book that really explains institutional racism, institutional and systemic um, prejudice and what that, how that has shaped in society to get us to where we are today. So what I can uh, do, Dawn, is send you that list if you'd like, and you can share that out with all of the individuals that are on this call today. Oh, that would be fantastic. Thank sure. you so much. All right, everyone, that is the end of today's Q&A session. Um, please know that you can reach out to Dr. Coleman directly and Shakira can give that information out. Thank you so much, Don. And thank you so much, Dr. Coleman. We really appreciate it. Um, the next slide that you all are seeing has Dr. Coleman's um, contact information. So if you all have any follow-up questions or thoughts that you would like to run by Dr. Coleman, here is her contact information so you all have it. And um, also one, yes. one last thing, I would I really urge all the participants that are here to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Let's get connected. I'd love to hear your feedback. I'd love to hear more of what you would like for DEI specialists and professionals to be speaking on, what challenges you might be having. I really look to participants to kind of help frame what my next speaking engagement, the information that I share, because I think it's really important to stay um, relevant and also to stay current on what's happening. And I can only do that with you all's feedback. Yes, that's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Coleman. We really appreciate you for being available and for being so present and excited 
to be a part of our first virtual event. This has really been an honor and we really appreciate your knowledge and expertise and willingness to communicate with other alumni. So thank you so much. And I wanna give a shout out to the entire team. You all really plan and organize this beautifully and I really appreciate your time, but also appreciate your sheer passion for this work and making sure that we address these issues. That's great. Thank you so much. We, we appreciate you. So everyone, thank you so much for attending our first event. But before you go, I definitely want to mention that this is the start of a three part series. So our next series is going to be Wednesday, September 16th, 2020 from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. via Zoom. Um, and we invite you all to invite other Black alums, invite other alums and other networks to be a part of these conversations. We will share more details with you soon. We also have a Black Loyola alumni Facebook page. So if you haven't joined, make sure you join to get updates about our upcoming events and things that are going on within the Lo Loyola community. So again, thank you to Loyola University and Loyola Alumni Re Relations for supporting us with this event. Thank you, Dr. Coleman, for being our first guest and doing <laughs> such an amazing job. And thank you to the yeah. Black Alumni Board, as well as all of you who attended today. Thank you so much for your time, and we really appreciate you for joining us. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Yes. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>